I know you're going to dig this. Ryan McGlynn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles, recorded live here at DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio. And now, in our studio, our studio guest today is Mr. Stephen Shockley, hey. <laughs> the original guitarist from Dayton's own Lakeside. Welcome. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing well. It is just so happy to have you here with us and uh, and to have this rare opportunity to talk to an original member That's me. of uh, <laughs> Lakeside. So I want to start off with just a little background. Where were you born and how did you get the Dayton connection? Well, I was born in Chicago, Illinois, you know. Um, my family moved here to Dayton when I was about five years old, you know, and lived on Kilmer Street. <laughs> and that's where I started picking up everything, you know. I, I started getting in, interested in the music, I guess, when I got about 11, you know. So what, what school were you in when you were about 11? Uh, well, that'd be... Um, Weaver. Okay, okay. <laughs> I went to Wagaman, then the Weaver, then the Roosevelt, you yeah. know. So music, how did, how did music really, you said 11 years old. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, what was significant with music at that time? What instrument? What, 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 what was it that triggered you to say, you know, I like music? Well, I had a friend named Tony White, James White, and he, he does a lot of things with the youth around here today, you know, with teaching, dancing, and singing, you know. But we would harmonize. We had learned how to harmonize singing, you know. And that was, like, interesting. Wow, we actually harmonized, you know. And A cappella, of course. Yeah, and we were sitting up making instruments, you know, I make drum sets out of Folgers, the big Folger coffee cans, you know, and uh, made cigar box guitars, and I had a little harmonica. We had a little set of bongos, <laughs> you know, and we were showing, I mean, because we were interested. In fact, we put together a little singing group, and we sung at Sean Acres. Okay. That was our, my first ever... In, Thing into music was singing the Shine Acres and a little singing group. Uh, how many uh, were in your singing group? It was four of us. And uh, what was that song? What, what, what did you sing? Just name one song. We sung sing? Hurt So Bad by Little Anthony and the Imperials. Oh, wow. That, yeah. that is so exciting. Well, you know, when you talk about the harmonizing, that reminds me back, back in the day where, yeah. where, where, where guys would stand on the street yeah. corner yeah. and uh, put on like I would call mini concerts and everybody be yeah. listening. And uh, and so many groups, not mm. only from Dayton, but throughout the East Coast came from mm. that particular uh, sound of music. Mm. So you get into, tell me how, how you evolved in to Lakeside. Well. Because you, you know, we, we want to make sure we preface it the fact that you're an original member of mm. Lakeside. Well, it's, it's funny, my mother realized that I was had a little musically inclined. I was musically musically inclined, <laughs> and she was going to give me a keyboard. But in those days, every, our keyboards were huge. 
you know, the organs, you know, the pianos, and couldn't carry them around, you know. So she decided on the guitar, because I was making guitars at the house, you know. And so she got me one. In fact, it'll be 50 years this Christmas when I started playing. I got a Sears and Roebuck guitar, you know. And I just started playing, and then you start finding the local neighborhood people who can play a little bit, you know, and you start hanging around together. And my mentor was a guy who was left-handed. His name was Boots Vaughn. He still plays around. He's a really good guitar player. And I started learning from him, and then I formed my own little band, you know. But I started getting professional. I guess I was about 13. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get my first payday, you know, um, and I was playing at the Ebony Club and the uh, Oak Leaf Club in the backwoods, you know, I was playing out there. And my mother used to drag me out to the Jetport Lounge at the Jamaica Inn where she was kind of co-managing the place, you know. And I would meet all of these great jazz players, you know, she would make me go up there and sit in on her. Um, Sunday matinees and stuff. And my mother got pictures of George Benson and everybody at our house, and I never even met them till recently, you know. But I met a lot of people. I played with. When I look back on it, I played with some big guys just jamming on Sunday matinees, you know. Jack McDuff and uh, Yusef Latif, <laughs> people like that. She was making me go up there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I started and I put together a band called the Monterey's. And we were playing the same clubs, Ebony Club, Oak Leaf Club, and this and that. And then so... How many were in the Monterey's? About seven. And What we, were the instruments? Um, we had three horn players, and we had three in the rhythm section. <laughs> And we had a lead singer. His name was Lil Tweety. <laughs> he was out of Indiana. And we went to California. I was 15. And when we went out to California, my mother let me go. You know, we all packed up in the van and <laughs> drove to California. And we played all the nightclubs. <laughs> I had to stay in the back because a lot of the nightclubs were uh, Strip clubs. <laughs> and so I was in the back, you know, peeking out, trying to be a man. It, it kind of ruined me because when I came back to Dayton in 69, it was 1969, and tried to go back to high school, I was just so outgrown. <laughs> the kids in the class, you know, they were still throwing paper, and <laughs> I'm like, Wow, I can't do this. And they didn't teach music uh, the way, well, they didn't teach guitar. Nowadays, you can get guitar if you can find a school with music. <laughs> you can get guitar lessons and stuff. They had me trying to play a trombone. Uh, I want to go back. So you were 15 when you went to California. So how, how old were you when you came back to Dayton? I was 15. We only went out there for a few weeks. Uh, but you're saying in those few weeks mm -hmm. and that experience, well, it made you mature way past your. your well, see, when I was playing at the Oak Leaf Club, I was about fourteen, and I was playing at five in the morning, and we were playing behind cross dressing reviews and Sheena the Glass Dancer and the Sword Swallowers and everything out there at the Oak Leaf Club. You know, entertainment. It was grown up entertainment. You know, but I was like the house band. You know. And so I saw a lot, you know, when I was really young, I saw a whole lot of stuff, you know. Think of this, the club owner's name was Razor Christian, <laughs> right? He's a good guy, but you had to wonder why his name was Razor. <laughs> you know, they had some really good, um, it was a really good learning experience. I played with some, everybody was always older than me, you know. So when we went to California, that was a really learning 
experience. You know, we played till four in the morning all the time. I played behind Red Fox and. So how long did you stay in California? Uh, we stayed about six weeks total. You know. Came back home. Came back home. And then what? Tried to go back to school. So what happened? This is still the Monterey's, correct? Yeah, but they they kicked me out at this point. Okay. Because I was too young. And I had to go back to school, and they wanted to continue traveling and going to clubs and stuff, you know. But I had to go back to school, and I just couldn't take it. I was in the ninth grade three years in a row, because I never went. You know, I had good grades when I did, but I just, I it was set in stone that I was going to play guitar, you know, and I was ready to go. So... I started putting together another band. Now the same guy that I told you I used to harmonize with as a kid. That's Tony. Tony. All right. He said, man, come check out our singing group. They had formed a singing group. And they were called the Nomads. And they was playing at the Springfield, when they used to have those regional talent shows in Springfield. They were playing there. So I went and saw them and I said, wow, that's a good group. <laughs> I mean, they were really good. It's dancing and singing, they can harmonize real well. And so I said, that's, that's good, man. Y'all y'all really good. And then, so I started putting together a band, and we were called the Young Underground. The <laughs> you Young know. Underground, okay. Right. And so I hooked up with Tony. I said, and Tony said, Steve, uh, we need to merge. You know, we, we would be the backup guys, musicians, they'd be the dancers and singers, you know. And that gave us a way to have a, sh a, a pretty big show, you know, so we could do things, you know. And we did. And we got kind of popular real quick, you know. We was doing well in the talent shows, Rolf Roosevelt, Dunbar talent shows, all of those. And, and we started getting a name, and we started doing the regional circus, Indiana, Kentucky, you know. Um, Lima, Urbana. Lima, yeah. <laughs> and playing all them <laughs> places in them clubs, you know. And and then um, this guy out of Chicago got wind of our group, and his name was Eddie Thomas. And he's a big guy up in Chicago. He was partners with Curtis Mayfield, and they had a record com company called Curtime. It's Curtis and Thomas, right? So Curtom Kurt Tom Records, they, they turned out to be a pretty big label for a while. And so we we're going to be in this talent show, and the winner gets the record deal. And so we won the talent show, but he didn't like our name, Nomads and the Young Underground. In fact, we had, before before that we had changed it just to the Young Underground. We dropped the Nomads when we really merged and became a big band, self-contained band. Uh, we called ourselves the Young Underground, and they didn't like the name. So for that one night, nobody knows this, but for that one night we were called the Equations Four Plus Four. <laughs> okay. I said, you made us drop our name for that? The equations four plus four. But that didn't last long because when we got to Chicago and we started meeting people, then Curtis Mayfield and Eddie Thomas broke up. And the record company went under after that. And Eddie Thomas said, well, I'm starting my own label called Lakeside, right? And we was in Chicago, and you can see across there, and they had a newspaper place called the Lakeside Express, you know, and stuff like that. And I said, Lakeside, yeah, okay. I said, and we said, let's be the Lakeside Express. And that was the newspaper, right? I said, okay, we'll do that. And so we recorded, but it was, you know, we didn't have any studio experience. We were still youngsters, you know. We didn't know how to actually make a So record. that's how you got the name Lakeside? Well, that's how we got it. Now, when that didn't happen, the Lakeside records and all of that, we came back to Dayton, you know, 
Now, we had all grew up at Lakeside Park, right? Roller coasters, good fun time. So we said, let's hold on to the name because, you know, they do set a train that ran around the Lakeside Park, you know, the Lakeside Express, you know. And so they said, we gonna hold on to this name, you know, because we grew up here and this is where we played and we all have fun here at Lakeside Park, you know. So we kept the name. Plus, it's a street called Lakeside Drive, so we already had our street, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, that that that's how we kept the name Lakeside, you know. But we originally got it in Chicago. That, that's an interesting. I, I don't know how many people really know that story, but it was a very interesting story because when you were talking about Chicago, I'm thinking about the lake, uh -huh. and I could see the Lakeside there, and then, mm -hmm. but I. Originally, when you think of the group coming out of Dayton named Lakeside, you immediately think of the amusement park and uh -huh. the area of Lakeside. So uh, I can see the similarities there and yeah. wise choice. Yeah. It, it, you, you could identify with it from Chicago's perspective as well mm -hmm. as from the Dayton perspective. So now that we're there, we have the name. Mm -hmm. uh, how old are we now? Um, I guess about six. 1970 is when we were the Lakeside Express. Actually, Mark's sister was in the group, and her name was Shirley Woods. And yeah, we we were the Lakeside Express. We were kind of like Gladys Knight and the Pips, you know. We had the one girl in the group, but then she wanted to go to college, and so she left the group. And we had a Ricky Abernathy, who was a great singer from the neighborhood, who also sung in that group that that I started with in Shine Acres. You know, he's one of the singing singers in that group. You know, we all lived around the corner from each other. You know, he lived on Second Street. I lived on Kilmer. Tony lived over on Marion. <laughs> no, he didn't live on Marion. He lived closer to Roosevelt. But anyway, Ricky joined the group. And then, you know, because I was in Los Angeles with the Monterey's, I didn't realize that Ricky was an original member of the Nomads. But he had left before I found out about him, you know. But he actually named the group the Nomads. But Ricky um, still sings very good today. You know, he was in town not too long ago, did a show at the club. But um, now, where is Ricky now? Uh, he's in Los Angeles. Los Angeles. But um, I talked to him the other day. We was trying to do a show at the Victory Theater, but. Um, couldn't get, put it together quick enough, so like I said, I went on and took another gig in Georgia <laughs> for this year, but um, Ricky was going to open that show with us, you know. But we, um, he was a great singer, you know, and we went to California. We were getting ready to graduate from high school, at least all the other guys did, but we went to Oklahoma to do a show and we got fired from that club because now we were a bigger band and we played kind of loud, you know, and so the man kicked us out, you know. And we was going to come back to Dayton and Tommy Shelby said, man, let's go to California. Man, we only got $75. <laughs> man, we can get enough gas to get to California. And I said, well, I got some contacts in California, you know, from the first time I went with the Monterey's, you know, when I was 15. So I used those contacts, you know, to see if we can get an audition once we got there. Because we totally plan on staying on the beach. Totally. And so we took out. And we got to California and we found Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> And I swear, we walked from one end of Sunset to the other and turned around and walked back. And that was a long walk, but we were just seeing all the places, you know. And I saw Dick Clark, American Bandstand offices, you know. It's like, we're going to get on there, you know. We're going to get on Dick Clark, you know. And we just walked and walked. And then so when we got back to our van, uh, we was driving down Sunset and we saw this club, you know, it was a nice club and it was all black people standing out there, you know. I said, wow, that's a nice spot. Let's go in and ask, can we play? 
And we actually did go in there and ask could we play. And <laughs> sorry. And they said, yeah. So we set up. And it was about one in the morning, and we set up and we played, and the people liked us and stuff, you know. Then we found out where the local motel was where we could camp out for a night. You know, we'd get two rooms, and everybody sleep in those two rooms, you know. And we auditioned for the club that I had played in when I was younger with uh, Red Fox and all of those people, Lawanda Page, everybody that was on Sanford and Son. <laughs> was local comedians, you know. And that's who I was playing behind when I was young, you know. Then the club owner let us come there and audition. And he liked the group and he said, well, you guys can play here, you know, and open up for a couple of acts that was there, you know. And we drew, started drawing little crowds, you know. and. We didn't have no place to stay, so he had a little shed out in the back of the club, and we made that the band house. He said, y'all can stay in there. He said, but ain't no restrooms or nothing, you know. So eventually, he let us clean up the club, and after it closed, excuse me, sleep in the club. So that's what we were doing. We were playing and then sleeping in the club after it closed. <coughs> excuse me. And... One day, um, at that time, your name was Lakeside Express. Yeah, yeah, we were Lakeside Express. Okay, and then we got around. One of the guys went around on Crenshaw Boulevard, and to this club, there's all the what you would call upperly mobile black people, the kids. There's the children of stars. You know, they all went to this club. It was like the place to be. You know and it's called Maverick's Flats. And the bass player was walking by the window and there's this girl group called The Love Machine, you know, and he recognized one of them was his cousin. He said, that's Renee, that's my cousin, you know. And so he went in there and asked him to see Renee and then, you know, who is this guy, you know. And he ended up talking the owner of the club to come, would he come around, it was only around the corner to see us audition, so we could audition for him to play at this club. And he came around, he brought some of the girls with him and they were, and then we auditioned. And he said, yeah, okay. So he let us open up for the love machine. And uh, now, Coming from where we came from, they know how, and all these hot bands, it wasn't really no competition for us out there. I'm not just, this is the truth. If you can make it out of Dayton, then you were really good, you know. And so those, they didn't really know how to put on shows. They were kind of Vegas y and kind of, you know, corny. <laughs> you know, it was like, uh, and then, we were there only a few weeks, man, and we had lines around the corner going up the next block. It was like, we got held over for five months. <laughs> we played at that club for five months. And so we started getting a name on Crenshaw Boulevard because that was like the black <laughs> Sunset Boulevard, right? And so we started getting a name. And then Ohio players, they were getting big. And so they wanted us to stick Ohio on the front of our name, just to draw a crowd, you know, that we're something different than just an L.A. band, you know. So we, for a brief moment, for maybe a year, we were the Ohio Lakeside Express. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying this history. Yeah, yes. we were the Ohio Lakeside Express for a while. and. We uh, played and we did really well, you know. We always felt like we were just as good as any band, you know, out there. So we would put ourselves in positions like one time Motown was throwing this show and on Crenshaw, at the Crenshaw Palace. And Eddie Kendricks, it was his show. 
And his brother had a singing group called The Posse, and they had just got signed to Motown. And so we were just trying to get on the show, be an opening act, and get seen, you know. And they let us. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. We tore that place up. Next day, the Motown people's around trying to sign us, you know. And we did sign with Motown. That was the first. It was ironic. I always wanted to sign with Motown when they was in Detroit. Like we out in California. They done moved to California. And we signed with Motown in California. And the weird thing is, they came to see us audition at the same club. It was called the California Sahara Club. And they had a group called the Dynamic Superiors. And they had us. We was auditioning. And they asked us, could the Dynamic Superiors audition before us, you know, at the same time in the same club? And uh, I said, sure. This is a really good singing group, you know. So we both auditioned and most town signed both groups. They let Ashford and Simpson produce Dynamic Superiors and they put Eddie Kendrick's producer with us. Uh, you know, and he was hot at the time. He had out Keep On Trucking and all those records. And so but they didn't really know what to do with us. You know, they said, Is there, are they a Temptations type of singing group? Because, you know, we had a singing group. Or are they the Commodores, a band? They didn't know what to do, you know. And so they cut of one record on us, and they just kind of forgot about us, you know. And uh, Ashford and Simpson cut a song on the other group, and their record took off a little bit, you know. And so we said, okay. But everybody knew they was a singing group. They didn't know what to do with us, right? So at this time, Dick Griffey, from so he didn't have Solar Records. He was a big time concert promoter, right? He ruled. <laughs> he had the Jacksons, uh, Stevie Wonder. He was booking all the big shows, you know. And so he came around and... So what year are we talking about about now? Uh, about 74. Yeah, we went to California in 72 as Lakeside Express and around 74. Okay, now when we left Motown... So, so excuse me, so we, we, we signed with Motown. It didn't go so well. Right. Are we at Ohio uh, Lakeside Express at this time? Or are we Lakeside Express? Well, when we signed with Motown, we dropped the Ohio. Okay. We back to Lakeside Express. Okay. okay. So after Motown, um, Frank Wilson, who produced Eddie Kendricks and wrote a lot of stuff for Gladys Knight, all of Mo he was a Motown guy. He liked the group. He said, well, look, I got a deal over here at ABC Records for you. Let's go over there. And at this time, we had picked up Dick Griffey as our manager. And he helped get us out of Motown. And we went over to ABC, and he was kind of against it, but he said, go ahead, I, you know, do, do what you need to do. He said, but you know what? Y'all need to drop that express and just be lakeside. And, uh, and I said, I never did like it anyway. Me personally, I didn't like the name Lakeside. I really didn't. I mean, just, it just didn't seem to be our personality. We was kind of some street guys, you know. And that was kind of clean and foo foo for me, you know, at first. Then, you know, as the picture starts to get drawn, you know, Dick used to always say, you know, the audience going to tell you who you are. You have all these ideas about who you want to be and this and that, he said, but the public is going to tell you who you are. That, that's, that's a very profound statement now. Mm -hmm. Ken told you that? Dick Griffey. Dick Griffey. And Dick Griffey is the one that suggested to drop the Express? Yeah. Okay, so, I, yeah. but that's a very profound statement. Yeah, he said, you can run around here and write all of this and all of that and say I'm a singing group and I'm this and that. But the audience is going to tell you who you are. So 
we recorded an album. None of us were music readers. And the producer, Frank, he likes to come in, and that's this the way they did it, you know. Let's cut some songs and get out of here. Time is money, money, you know. We don't have time to fool around with amateurs, learning stuff, and here's the chart music, play it. So I can read, and none of the other guys can read. So he had other musicians do the music, and the vocalist did the singing, you know. We had great vocalists. And I was like, you know, I was bummed a little, but it just made me want to step up, you know. I need to learn how to read, you know. But I never got to that because ABC Records folded, <laughs> All right? So we, we had a song come out, and it was starting to get on the charts and stuff. And then it just died because the record company died, you know. And ABC just said, I mean, Shaka Khan was there, Lenny Williams, uh, Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis. It was, and we sung on all their records. Like Lenny Williams' record, you hear, uh oh, uh oh. Anyway, that's us singing on his record, you know. We're singing on a lot of everybody's records then. And so after that folded, we were still the hottest thing on Crenshaw. And then the Gap Band, they came. <laughs> they was on Crenshaw, so it was like the dueling bands, you know, us and the Gap Band, you know. They were great. They were a hot group. <laughs> and uh, we uh, end up Norman Whitfield. Now, if he's a big Motown producer, you know, he did Temptations. All of the Papa was a Rolling Stone, and he did all the records, you know. And he was hot. He had Car Wash out with Rolls Royce, you know. He that was his band, Rolls Royce. And he said he wanted us bad, you know, come to Whitfield Records, you know. And he still had that old mentality that why don't y'all just be what y'all are? Y'all entertainers, y'all do that. I'm gonna handle the music, I'm gonna write, you know, I got writers and this and that. Now, we was a show band, so we had never wrote songs. You know, we were just playing top 40 and putting on shows. We had never wrote songs. And that was his point, he said, well, you know, but we knew that's where the money was. But we hadn't wrote songs, but we were seeing groups come out of date now, okay, you got the Ohio players writing all their songs. You got Slave coming out, and they writing their songs, and Roger and them, they writing their songs. We writing our songs. <laughs> I don't care if we never wrote a song in life. We want to, whoever signed us, we writing our songs. So um, that's what Dick Griffey said. He said, well, look, I'm starting Soul Train Records with Don Cornelius, and uh, y'all can come sign there. And we, we kind of liked the idea of Soul Train and that, but we said, Dick don't know how to produce no records. Don Cornelius don't know how to produce records. How's he going to do this? You know, why would we go there? You know? But Dick was smart, you know, and he, was, uh, he had been out there with all these groups, you know, as a concert promoter and stuff, and he knew all, where all the com people were. So... He said, well, I'll tell you what. Y'all come with me, and you write half the album. And in case you don't know what you're doing, I have the other half <laughs> to get some pros to do it, you know. So we said, OK, we'll go for that one. You know? And that's the way we started with Soul Train Records. But before we signed, Don Cornelius quit. And so they go Soul Train, but Dick said, I'm going to call it Solar, you know, Sound of Los Angeles Records, Solar. And I said, okay, that's cool. But who are we going to use to help us get, you know, record these records? And he said, I got this young guy, man. 
you know Leon Silvers from the famous Silvers singing group family, you know. And we said, ah, oh, really? Now, we had heard something that Leon did with Shalimar, because Shalimar was like one of the, well, Dick already managed the Whispers. But Shalimar was his new group, and they had a little disco record going. And Dick was doing well. I said, uh-oh, he kind of know how to get this done. He had to deal with RCA, and RCA was putting the records out. You know, I said, okay. So with Solar, he said, okay, go ahead and write your records. And we, we set out to do it. And it turns out that the Kunga player that we had, he had this little synthesizer, and he could play with one finger. He didn't even know how to play keyboards. He was just playing one finger. And he made up this bass line. And he started singing this all the way live, you know. And he wrote this song called All The Way Live. We hated it because we weren't a funk band. You know, we're not a funk band. We never play funk in our life, you know, so. It was kind of, we thought we were going to do some stuff like the OJs and Temptations, you know, because we got this singing group and blah, blah, blah. But he wrote this song. And then I was writing love songs mostly and some up tempo stuff, but Dick Griffey heard it and he said, it's a hit in this record. <laughs> if y'all get it straightened out, it's a hit in this record. So he put us with Leon Silvers, and Leon produced it and cleaned it up and made it really a, a nice record, you know. And we were still like, okay. Man, Dick put that record out and it took off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, our very first song that we even tried to write, you know, it just all took, the way live. Yeah, it just took off, you know. And so it was like, okay, we're in the ballpark. Then this ballad, love ballad, given into love that I had wrote, it took off. But we never could release it as a single because all the way live just stayed on the charts forever. It stayed on the charts almost a whole year. And we was so he didn't want to interrupt the momentum of all the way live by putting out the next single, because as soon as you put out the next single, the radio's going to stop playing that and move on to this. So he just let all the way live go as long as it could go. And by that time, everybody had bought the album, and they already had given in the love, you know, so it didn't do that much as a single, but it was really a hot record off the album, you know. We got down to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, doing our first big concert. And we didn't know giving in the love to perform it on stage. You know, we had recorded it and everything, but we didn't know the record was hot. And we got down there, and everybody was asking about giving in the love more so than all the way live. And it was like, we don't know the song. We had to learn the song that day at Soundcheck and perform it that night. Because if we wasn't getting out of there without playing that song, you know. And so the, that took off. And everything from that point was just, remember that statement I said, Dick Griffey said, the audience is going to tell you who you are? They told us we was a funk band. <laughs> For all the singing and all the stuff you thought you was doing, you are now a funk band. <laughs> And then the next hit was a funk record. And we kept writing them. They kept coming out. You know? And then we finally came up on Fantastic Voyage, and it was gone. Now, what year was it? That was 1980. 1980, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic Voyage. Well, that's after we did the first album, and then we did the Rough Riders album, which was the second album. We had a couple of. Pretty good hits off of it. It wasn't as strong as what they say all the other albums were, but it, it was good, you know, it did well. Uh, and then so by the third album, we were ready to produce ourselves and write our, write our own stuff. 
So there's something to be said for doing your own stuff and finding your own magic. We were ready then as a group, not just as individuals, but as a group we were ready because Fantastic Voyage was the first song that we all wrote together. And that came about because we finished the album and we turned it in and Dick said, this is a great album, but I think y'all need to go back in and one more big smash record because I think y'all still need that super smash record. And we was like, where that gonna come from? So we went back into the studio and took tapes from different little rehearsals and stuff and was finding grooves and we was mixing them together and till we came up with a track. And Fantastic Voyage, we was actually in, when we were writing it in the studio, we were doing the Beverly Hillbillies rap. You remember? <laughs> Come listen to a story about the men. We had that on tape. We had everything on tape, function at the junction. <laughs> we was, you know, we was just making up stuff, comedy, and we put through it all in the record. And we turned it in, and he said, whoa. You should have saw us trying to rap, because rap was just coming out then, right? Sugar Hill Gang and all those guys. And so we said, we need to put a rap on this song. But didn't nobody know how to rap. One at a time, he's going in there. Get out. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> you can't rap. Get out. <laughs> you know, so we end up rapping as a group, you know, and it worked. And so we had it in the middle of the song. And when we turned it into Diff Dick Griffey, he said, man, the song is great, but it didn't really get exciting until that rap came in. So this is what I want y'all to do. Go in the studio, stick razor blade, slice that out, move it up to the front of the song. He said, because when DJs put on the record, you only got 10 seconds, 15 at the most. If they're not impressed, it's getting thrown in the corner. You know? So he moved the rap up to the beginning of the song. And so soon the DJs put it on, it was like on, you know. And it worked. I mean, we was number one in seven weeks. We came out, pow, that's what that record was leaping. We got up to number two and Michael, Michael Jackson, no, we got up to number three and Michael Jackson was number two with Heartbreak Hotel. And we said, well, we ain't gonna get that number one spot because Michael Jackson is gonna be moving to number one next week, I know. We jumped over him. And we got to number one. And Heartbreak Hotel stayed at number two. And we was like, whoa, Fantastic Voice was on fire. And we said, okay. But once again, it was another big funk record. <laughs> but the advantage they gave us is that we, we was a singing group doing funk. So it made our vocals more polished and more prevalent than most funk bands. You know, most funk bands had just a singer out there or somebody. They weren't really singing group singers. They were, you know, good enough to sing, but it gave us an advantage in the ears because now we can do this high choreography and stuff the singing groups do. We had all of that still in the show, you know, that a lot of bands couldn't do, you know. So we had an edge. But all of a sudden, the band is just as important as the singers now. Because all the funk that we were putting out was coming from within the band. So now the musicians are important. You know, usually we're just the backup guys to the singers, you know. And we was always wondering. In fact, this is a true story. When we were getting ready to sign the Soul Train, and we were all in the office, and Don Cornelius was standing there, and Dick, and Don said, it's one thing that confuses me. Why y'all want to sign the musicians? He said, you know, he didn't get it because we had a singing group, something like the Whispers or whatever, 
And you can hire musicians anywhere. Why you, why you want to sign the musicians to a recording contract? And Dick, he got it. He said, shut up, fool, man. <laughs> if they want to sign 10 people to a, a recording contract, let them. You know, don't count their money. <laughs> you know, they're going to get this amount of money. And if they want to split it up with 10 people, let them split it up with 10 people. If don't break up the band, <laughs> how you gonna do that, you know? And so, you know, Dime was out, and and the rest is history, because the band turned out to be important, you know? Like I said, the very first song came from the Kunga player, you know? And then I wrote the next single, and I was the guitar player. So the band started becoming important, you know? So now we was all one. You know. So, so do you all get royalties still from your music? Mm -hmm. Especially since the the internet and stuff, they have a company called Sound Exchange, and they collect your money as an artist from a lot of places where there's money coming in that you wouldn't have never been able to collect yourself. You know, yeah. they're set up for that. You know. Wow, well, I mean, and, and that goes back again to show how important writing. Uh, music is and yeah. producing, but you know this whole history of all the way up to now we're up to Lakeside yeah. and Fantastic Voyage. So how long did the group stay together after that? We're still together. You're still together. Now <laughs> tell me, tell me about where we are right now with Lakeside. Well, through it all. Um, in 2011, that's where we had our first real, uh, they're just like all the other bands type thing. The lead singer leaves and he think he can do this and that. And the band, you know, now you got two versions of the group out there and all that stuff. I hated that. I mean, I really hated that. That's the worst thing ever. You know, and it was worse for us because we were been together 35, going on 40 years at this point. Been and, through a lot. Oh, uh, through a lot. You know, everything. We we went through everything, the lows, the highs, everything. And we always were scared to break up. <laughs> You know, because now our whole lives are invested in each other. What am I gonna do after if I leave Lakeside? <laughs> you know. So we stood, so we stayed together because we we were still a good band, you know, and no, we really didn't know what else we was gonna do. I mean, I thought about it a lot. Go get a job. I don't do. Go play in the hotel circuit. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't know nothing else to do, and neither did all the rest of the guys. There's a couple of guys that left, but now they're back in the group. And I put the whole group back together after Mark Wood, our lead singer, left. And uh, I said, man, I'm gonna get the original band back together, you know. And everybody was wanting to. See, because we know throughout the history of Lakeside, no one has ever been fired. Nobody. If you quit, you quit on your own. You know, and most of the time when people quit, we weren't angry. It wasn't a, a beef going on, you know. It was like they wanted to do something else. You know, they thought, well, okay, now's the time, you know. And they got the chance to do that. But they were always welcome back in the group if that spot was open, you know. And that's, you know, all the spots were open, you know. I got Otis back in, you know. And unfortunately, the keyboard player we had, he passed away. He was from Los Angeles. And so when he passed away, we bought in back in Norman Beavers, our original keyboard player, you know. So now I had the original band back, and Otis was back, and Tommy Shelby came back in the group, and, um, Timar is the only one that's still not back in the group, but he's a, a minister, you know. He's got his own church and everything, and he's doing really well. 
So, um, more power to Timo. He's like our spiritual <laughs> guider, and he's still like um, what you would call an honorary member of the band. You know, he can come and sing with us anytime he feel like it. You know. But everybody's back together. Mark is out there now. He has his own band, you know. And lo most of them are local guys here from Dayton. And I'm I'm still offended by that, you know, because I mean, I'm not dead. I, I band never even broke up. Now there's somebody else out there proud to say that they're Lakeside. I mean, that's weird to me, you know. Although I know everybody does it. There's a thousand bands out there with a duplicate going. But I, I hated that, you know, because we were brothers, you know. We weren't... <sighs> uh. Well, tell me about where Lakeside is now. Well, what's the future? Well, we're the original Lakeside. We've taken on a whole theatrical thing now. Oh, you know? Theatrical? Yeah, yeah. We're turning our show into a stage play. All right, now. <laughs> you know, we, we have a whole uh, swashbuckler pirate thing, you know. <laughs> oh. Yeah, because, you know, Fantastic Voyage, we were pirates on that album. Actually, we were swashbucklers. Pirates was kind of rowdy. <laughs> but we take it on as pirates. Everybody call us pirates, so yeah, we the pirates. And so now we do our whole stage dress and everything like that, you know. So where you put, where, where, where's your next venue? Um, we're going to do a show in Albany, Georgia uh, for New Year's Eve. All right. And uh, we're looking forward to that. I wanted it to be the Victoria Theater. I was really trying to put that together, but couldn't get it all done in, in time enough to start advertising and everything. You know, but we were really trying to do that. Well, we always got next year. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and now that you all are back on the, the scene, uh -huh. and I, I think that um, a lot of things will be happening for you. Yeah. And, and, and I, I tell you, I, I can't tell you how much I really have enjoyed this. And it's been, um, uh, you, you're a great uh, uh, person to, to tell the story and that I can feel the pain about the separation yeah. from you. And, and hopefully, maybe down the road, that, that'll work itself out for good. Hmm. And if it doesn't, then yeah. it wasn't meant to be. Yeah. But I want to thank you for um, donating to uh, huh. the Funk uh, Music Hall of Fame. And, and I was able to be there at the event that we had that you gave us your fancy belt. Was that a belt? Or a guitar a, strap. Get, see, I, I have a whole company now, you know, that I make those guitar straps for a lot of people. Oh, okay. You know, and that was the very first one ever made, you know. And, well, yeah. well, we're just happy to have it. Yeah. And uh, I really appreciate you being on the show. And uh, tell us why you think the funk, you know, since I, 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 I probably not a way to put it, but the best way, you're backdoor funksters. <laughs> you know, you never intended to say, hey, we're going to be funk. And so I call you the backdoor funksters that came back, came into the funk and really soared with it. Mm -hmm. And so why is it important to you that we succeed as having a funk music hall of fame and exhibition center? Well, because there's nobody who ever really, you know, subliminally, it could have been the name Funk itself, that nobody ever gave it credibility, you know? Because it's a form of R&B &B music that I thought is really credible, you know? And of course, there's been a lot of big funk bands out of it, you know, but like you said, it's, James Brown was the only funk solo guy, but he, you know, he intermingled with his band so much, it seemed like the whole thing. But James Brown was Mr. Funk, and then of course he had Sly and the Family Stone, you know, and they were, you know, but it was always bands, 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 you know. Now there's no bands, no new ones. <laughs> really miss the band music. Mm -hmm. Well, that all became economics for record companies. I, 
Uh, you can do everything on the computer at home. Why you need all these musicians? You know, why? You can't even to this day. If I was to walk around Dayton and try to scoop up eight people to be in a band or seven, and get them to come to rehearsal and put in that hard work, times have changed so much. They'd be like, "Why we gotta do all that?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, you gotta learn how to perform. Uh, we can learn how to perform after we get a hit. And, and and that's true, they'll go and get a choreographer and all of this stuff and learn how to put on the show, you know, the lights and the backdrops and all of this stuff because they got the money to do it, you know. Kids get, become millionaires really quick with one hit, you know, especially with the internet and stuff. So you seem silly talking about rehearsing and being in garages and stuff. I got a computer set up in my bedroom. <laughs> Let's go make a record. And uh, well, you know, so that's the that's what I always thought computers hurt the music industry because there's this movie called Fame, and this one guy was in the classroom playing the keyboards, and the professor was like. Why you want to be by yourself? He said, yeah, I can, and the boy said, I can do Beethoven and everything right here. And I'm like, why, you know, why need this big orchestra? I can do all of that right here. And the guy said, you really don't want to work with people? <laughs> you know, and that's a lost art. It's just like when everybody's sitting up looking at their phones and nobody's talking anymore, they texting. You know, well, it's the same thing with trying to put a band together nowadays. It's like, man, we can come over here and let's put a song together and put a name on it and put it out there. And see, they can do such good records in their hotel, in their little garage or whatever, that all of that is just silly to them. You know, it's really silly. I don't want to. Well, back in your day, mm -hmm. actual performance made a break, broke you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, you know, people would come to see you, and uh, and and I think that I, I really believe uh, you're going to be successful out there because there's a hunger mm -hmm. for folks to really want to hear music. Well, you know what? Real music. There's one guy. They're starting to do it because he know he's the only one out there. And that's Bruno Mars. Bruno Mars is putting out old school record after old school record. But he had crossed over first. Now he's bringing all the white people and all the other races back to this. And it seems brand new to them. But we already know what it is, you know. Wow, he's doing what we used to do. And his band is really good. And, 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 <laughs> and I think that's why I, I see your, 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 your success is going to be mm. uh, successful because, uh, you, know, you know, you go to places, you say, like, where's the horns? Where's mm. this? You know, and, mm. and that's why uh, bands like the Earth, Wind & Fire and, you know, uh, even uh, the old Chicago band, you know, mm. your horn, the horn section yeah. of Frankie Beverly and Maze, you yeah. know, that 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 mixture of right. music, right. And, and and I think that um, with what you're doing, and the, you, you just talked about Bruno, is bringing it all back to the forefront, and folks are saying, "Wow!" To them, it's new. To us, it's like, "Oh, it's refreshing." Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's refreshing. Yeah. I'm hearing music for a change instead of all the synthesized stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And he has horn players. You know, Bruno is doing it the old way. He puts on, he has nice choreography. I mean, the guys are really good. And you can tell he has an old school soul. You know, he's been over there in Hawaii or wherever he lived at. But it always seems like Outside of the United States, respected more than inside. Well, now, well, we, well, we know for mm -hmm. for so long, a lot yeah. of our, our entertainers went to Europe and yeah. other places to get respect, 
and have their music appreciated, right. and then they were welcomed back home. So. Yeah, it's, it's still kind of like that, because, you know, you, Mary J. Bly is twice as big in Europe as she is here. She's on that Tina Turner level over there. She's not, I mean, the big stadiums, you know. And that's because they like real soul music, you know. For Mary J, for whatever, she's not a computerized, gimmicky booty shaker. <laughs> you know, she's Mary She belts. J. She sings, and she sings from her heart and soul, and she don't have to be the most perfect singer in the world. They just want their soul. And they love her. So uh, do you have any trips planned? Uh, uh, have you done Well, any you know, we go to Europe? Japan a lot. You know, we haven't been over there recently, you know, but we're trying to get back over there. The economy has changed so much. You know, we're kind of a big band. And it's kind of hard to fly for other nightclubs over in Japan and Europe to fly a big band over, you know, 10 guys, and, you know. Maybe take a cruise and do play yeah. on the cruise and you know, cru <laughs> cruise your way on over. <laughs> yeah, we've been on some cruises. The Soul Train cruise was really great. Um, but that's the biggest problem we have with trying to get overseas. But when we go to Japan, people our age are sitting in the lobby waiting on the group to show up with your whole collection, you know, so you can sign the autographs. I'm talking about 40, 50 year old people, you know, because, you know, like if you're collecting art, you got a Mozart, right? <laughs> music piece, or you got a, a Picasso painting, and then you want to collect, the, you want to follow that artist. You really like that artist. <laughs> Even if they have a bummy picture by the same artist, you want that because it's part of the collection. That's the way they are in Japan. They want every album you have because they're following you as an artist, not by your latest song or your gimmick or nothing. They love this group and their artwork and then they follow you. So it's nothing to see 10 people in the lobby waiting for you to sign all their albums. They don't just have one. Look, I got your album. Yeah. They have the collection because you're an artist that they been following. And once they follow you, they follow you for life. It's not like they just, oh, well, they played out, you know, they're, they're through, they're done. What about in England, London? We've only been there maybe once to London. At that time, uh, everything was more disco -y and pop, oh. you know, at that time. And so we went on to France. When we put out that ABC album, we was over in France and had fun there. You know, Lakeside had a whole lot of training playing in front of other races and audience of people. You know, we used to play through Canada all the time, hardly ever see a black face, you know. But everybody needs to do that because your vibe and your way you sound and your presentation is all that matters. So when you go to Japan and they don't understand English, <laughs> You still gotta entertain them. You know, they like your song and they they don't even speak English. <laughs> but they're there, they pay their money, you know. And so you have to learn how to perform excitement without them really being able to understand what you're saying. That's a trip or understand your culture. You know, you'd be playing in front of uh a lot of, we did a lot of white shows, you know. Not just two years ago, we played with Three Dog Night, <laughs> right, in Alabama, <laughs> you know. So, you know, kind of crowd, but we, we you know, there, it was a lot of respect there, you know. It wasn't like, nobody's going to believe this, but when we play through the South, this is only me, in my opinion. When we play through the South and the places that you're supposed to be scared of, you know, 
You know, heard about Martin Luther King that been through there and that Selma and all of that. Those are the most integrated music people <laughs> that I've met. I mean, we be playing and it's just as many white people in the audience as it is black that know your stuff. It's, it's not like they don't know because they listening to the same radios and they're hearing the same thing. It ain't like white radio, black radio. I mean, you have that, but then there's a lot of mixtures going on, you know, now. And so we was like, wow, everybody know our stuff, you know. And we didn't have, I chalk it up to this. You can tell Martin Luther King had been through there. <laughs> you know, and the image he left behind. You can just tell. You know, it's, of course, there's still racism and there's all of that and that, you know, of course. But you can still feel that everybody's kind of comfortable <laughs> with each other. And these parks and these big festivals we plan at, everybody's mixed up, you know. And everybody knows the songs. That's why they was able to put on that concert, Three Dog Night with Lakeside and this and that, you know. And that was amazing to me. That's the biggest, I actually like that vibe, you know. I think music is the, 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 yeah. the key to the soul. It is. And, and yeah. uh, regardless, that, that's yeah. a unifying factor. Yeah, it was, you know. It was, so we've had some really cool experiences. I can talk forever. Well, I, well, we wrapped the show up a long time ago, I, well, right? <laughs> well, you know what? I, I've enjoyed this so much, and I know that our listeners will. And, and to have an original Lakeside member mm -hmm. to be here and, and share so much information, uh, I, I'm very thankful. And I know that David Webb, <laughs> um, our CEO of, of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center is just so appreci appreciative of you giving him, giving to our cause the, the, mm -hmm. the strap for the guitar. And I'm looking forward to uh, being able to come and hear the uh, lakeside somewhere within a reasonable distance from here, if not here at home. And I'd like to thank all of our viewers for being with us today as we listened to in awe with uh, mm -hmm. Stephen Shockley, a, a original member of uh, Lakeside. So I'm the host, Ryan McLenn of the Funk Music Hall of Fame Exhibition oh. Center's <laughs> award-winning show, Funk Chronicles. Until the next time, keep it funky. I like that. <laughs>